Today, we are in our series called Missional God, where we're talking about reach, about all of the things that we do uh, for people outside of the walls of this church. Now, if you're new to Riverview or you don't know what reach is, reach is every year we annually take up an appeal um, over and above our regular giving, the normal giving that we take up um, in, in our services, in, in our times together. This isn't that. This is over and above, and all the money that we raise goes to helping people in need. And I love it. I love seeing the generosity of our church every year. And this year, we're believing in faith to raise $450,000. Amazing. And um, the truth of the matter is, um, our capacity to reach that is tied to your generosity, and your generosity is sitting in your pockets. And uh, so I don't mean to be direct, but... Uh, it's time to get praying about what God wants you to give, okay? Uh, it's time to get praying about what, in a couple of weeks' time, on June 27th, Pastor Ken Lee's gonna be here, he's preaching a great word, and we're gonna take up an offering for reach. So I wanna encourage you to pray. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, so you've got a couple of weeks to get cheerful about the amount that He's calling you to give, all right? So um, just seek Him over the next couple of weeks and ask maybe your spouse if you're married, um, I always love the, the, the stab in the dark. What do you think about that number? And whoever's highest generally wins. So um, engage your faith, but let's be praying into that. Now, um, today, I just wanna shine a spotlight on the world and particularly what Riverview does across the world. We support um, projects in five countries, in um, uh, Rwanda, in Tanzania, in Timor-Leste, in uh, Cambodia, and in India. And the majority of what we do, um, actually, the... Some of what we do is just practical help. So things like uh, getting clean drinking water for people in Tanzania. Quite an incredible project that we support, Water for Africa. But a lot of what we do and most of the projects we support are about education, all right? Because what happens in these nations particularly is that children are forced to work in order to get money for their family to even eat. You know, this week has been my son's birthday, Judah. And uh, he's seven, he turned seven, and I bought him a Millennium Falcon, like the Lego thing that he puts together, it's been amazing. And so his goal has been to collect all of the characters in the Lego Star Wars series. That's like what he wants to do. Now, a couple of years ago, I was in Rwanda and these kids his same age are collecting clams by the side of the riverbed that's dirty and infested with garbage in order for their family to eat that night. Stark difference, right? And so what we give like genuinely makes a massive difference in people's lives. And it really helps break the poverty cycle, particularly in what I saw in Cambodia. And so while we were there a few years ago, we were able to shoot a story um, of many kids that have gone through these different programs that we support in these different, um, what do you call them? Uh, uh, projects, that's the one. Um, and so this is one of those stories we wanna show you tonight. This is Shrey Mia's story. Let's roll that on the screens. My name is Nicola. I work for Flame. I love my job. I'm the comms person, so I do external communications and I look after the people who make the most difference to us externally, which are our donors. When I was um, around about 13 years old, I went to Thailand and saw for myself uh, first hand some girls who were about my age who were pole dancing and they had uh, bikinis on they were standing standing on these bars with pole through the center with a, um, a wee number on their bikini and you could order them like you could order coke and I looked and I wanted to have some sense of what are you doing and the, the emptiness that blank dead-eyed and these these girls were like my age teeny boppers and there they were working in bars and being sold like coke and I thought yeah that the world isn't what I thought it was and so when I am given the opportunity to be able to help somebody who has had a really difficult beginning 
to get what they need so they can jump into something beautiful, to do something beautiful with their life. That excites me. I love that. My name is Remy. I'm studying English at university and I'm studying in second year now and I also work at Plymouth Square as a mobile library assistant. Well, we usually go to slum and we, we, we carry both table chair for the kids and then we go there, we make a class, like a class, and when the kids come to our class, we teach them the alphabet, we teach them English. We, we spend a lot of time with them, like playing games and make them happy and attract them to come. And it's really important that we inspire them to go to school. Yeah. Like my students, some of them cannot read at all. Some of them are 10 years old already, but they cannot read because yeah, they never go to school. So. My work is the big part for the little kids that they don't, they cannot read the book. So we teach them the alphabet and we teach them how to read. And for the older students, so we encourage them to read the book and to, you know, we provide them the book to read. we go to a construction site, we will see a version today of what Stramia was. She was one of those dirty little kids, no shoes and socks, just dirty, blackened skin, messy hair, working on a construction site, finding bits on a con so dangerous on a construction site and carrying them out and then trying to sell them I think she was about seven years old. I, I, I had been in Provence for, um, for my studying at high school, but I get, um, I have been getting, you know, like financial for support my study and also material books for my study as well. My life will be different from now, like, because I never, my family never expected that I can finish my high school. Yeah, and actually many, many times that I, I wanted to give up my high school because I, want to ha I wanted to have my family, but because of, I got supporting from Flame, it just like encouraged me to keep going yeah. until now. And right now, I'm not just finished my high school, but I still finish my university. I, I love learning language, actually, yeah. So that's why I choose English. In the future, when I become an English professor, I also want to be a part of them, like provide a free class for the student in Leadership Academy Hall. And I think English open a lot of opportunity for students, especially Cambodian students. When, when we were kids, it's really important to, you know, to feel loved, to feel encouraged, to feel supported from other people. It's really important that I can be a part of encouraging them to keep going to and to love going to school. It's, it works because when someone had that experience like me, 
and then we go to be close with them and it makes them feel like this is my, my example. See me as their example and said I, I also was in bad situation like them, but right now I'm better and move on. So it showed them that they also have a chance to move on. It just keep going. Don't give up. When she looks at those little children in the slum, she loves them. She knows. You see this kid now and you think, man, but she sees this kid now and she's like, you know what? That kid could be an accountant. That kid, that kid could be a doctor. Don't look at this child now and think how hopeless. You look at this child and you think, wow, oh, the potential is amazing. And the thing is, with poor children, they are able to become somebody who understands what it is to be poor. They're able to understand, because they know. They're in university now, but they used to be that poor little kid. You get a kid who was in the slums, graduating from university, going back into the slums and coming alongside somebody, there's power in the story of that. Inspiration is an essential ingredient in the story of somebody who from poverty has that economic mobility to get out. But they need to know that it's doable and realistic and how much more realistic than when you've got a Cambodian who was barefoot street kid orphan, now as a doctor, coming alongside these guys and saying, you know what? This doesn't have to be the end of your story. This is just the beginning. That's inspiration. And that's where the Cambodians, working with Cambodians, that's where the power is. Obviously, was able to meet Shreemia in church. I'm telling you, Shreemia's life and the change in her life, she's now in university studying to be a professor. How cool, right? And um, she, there's a direct correlation between our generosity and Shreemia's story. I just wanna encourage you, there's so much that's possible. There's so much opportunity as long as we give and we be generous. So um, let's step into that opportunity as a church together. Join me in giving later this month. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking on what to share today, and the truth is the church and mission is synonymous. Like, the church throughout history, and certainly in my memory, has always been at the coalface of mission. You know what I mean? Like, the church is always there, has always been there, and continues to be there. Um, so I think we understand that we have an individual commitment to justice and mercy in the world, but what is our communal commitment? Like what is the church's place in the world? What part do we play in the world? Why is it that mission is important to us? I wonder if you've ever, has anyone ever asked that question? Why, why is it that we're talking about this this month? Why is it that we're raising money for it? Who is the church? How does the Bible describe the church? And what is our mission to our local neighborhoods, to our city and to the world around us? Well. These are questions that keep me up at night. I don't know about you, but these are the things I've been thinking about and in what to share with you today. You know, over the last couple of years, I've probably been doing a bit of study on these questions and thinking about deeply about what is the church's call, like WWW church, like the what, the who, the why, all of that. Um, and so over the last couple of years, been wrestling with those things. And I wanna bring in the next 20 minutes, two years of work and thought in 20 minutes. So we're gonna do our best, but to do so, let's start by praying, hey? <laughs> 
Father, we just thank you for your presence here. And I pray that as I speak now, would you inhabit my words and give them an extra weight to them. Holy Spirit, go before me. And uh, would this word be received um, by good soil that accomplishes a harvest in years to come. Father, we thank you that your word says that your word will never return void, that it accomplishes the purpose for which it has been sent. So have your way today, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, so I've titled this message, um, Unity on Purpose, and I wanna share with you three key purposes of the church. But before we get to declaring what our purpose is, or what we do as a church, I think it's important that we understand who we are, our identity. So how does the Bible describe the church? Well, I think the Bible gives three images to describe the church throughout the whole of Scripture. Firstly, the first image is the people of God. The Bible calls the church the people of God. This is particularly rich in the Old Testament where God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm setting you apart and I'm sending you, telling you to leave your people and your nation. I'm establishing a new nation which would become Israel. And God, uh, from that moment on, started to call Israel as his own people, the special people or the chosen people of God. So God calls us his chosen people people, the people of God. And this, this um, metaphor, this image extends um, into the New Testament where Jesus describes the people of God of various tribes and tongues. Uh, the people of God image uh, shows up again where Jesus says, whosoever should believe in John 3.16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, whoever of various tribe and tongue, God calls us his people. Paul says in Corinthians that we belong to God and God chose us. There is a relational aspect to this image, being called the people of God. Paul uses the concept, this is the Apostle Paul, um, uses the concept of being the children of God, being adopted by faith. Um, Paul goes on to say that there's no Jew or Gentile under God, but we are one in Christ Jesus. Again, it's reinforcing this idea of the people of of God. The Apostle Peter lastly calls us God's chosen possession, his holy people, his royal priesthood. So the first image the Bible uses to describe the church is the people of God. The second image the Bible uses to talk about the church is the body of Christ, also the bride of Christ. These two images are relatable and used interchangeably throughout the Scriptures. Firstly, the bride, this is what Jesus said that he laid his life down um, for this bride, the church that he so dearly loves. And that obviously implies a covenantal commitment that Jesus says in Matthew that I will build my church and nothing will prevail against it. So there is a covenantal commitment just as in a relationship, a marriage. Um, the same is true with God's uh, love through Jesus for the church. Jesus also calls us his body and calls us, um, well, Paul actually uses that metaphor that we are the body of Christ, that we play many parts. The hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. You probably know the scripture. But importantly, we are called the body because we also have the mind of Christ as the church. What does that mean? Does it mean that God's deposited a little brain part of him inside our mind? No, it means that we are connected, connected to the head. You can't have a body that's decapitated from the head. It's dead, right? And so we are the body of Christ because we are connected to the head. And Jesus, the head of the church, pushes us, directs us, directs us, gives us purpose, gives us meaning, um, tells each part what part it is to play. So we're the body of Christ. The last image the Bible uses for the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So temple is a rich theological word use an image and symbol throughout the Old Testament. The temple, remember, was the place where God dwelt with people. It was the only place that God essentially inhabited and only the priests were able to go in. But thank you, God, that you sent Jesus, who was the perfect mediator, the high priest for us, that we now have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. What a crazy thought that God isn't just experienced and felt in the world just in the four walls of a temple, of a church. But God calls you the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so wherever you go in the world, you are carrying the Spirit of God and the authority of God with you. And uh, the Bible also uses some other language to describe us being the temple. He says, um, Paul says that we are living stones built into a temple before God. 
He also says that we are built upon Christ, the cornerstone, as a dwelling place for God. So temple is rich. So we are the body of Christ. We are the people of God, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's great, Zach. Really good images. Thank you, Bible. But what the heck does that mean? What, what does that mean for our purpose? How are we to understand then what we do as the church? If that's who we are and that's how the Bible describes us, um, what do we do? What is our purpose? I wanna talk to you tonight about three purposes of the church. And I trained as a teacher, but in all the 15 years I've been here, I've never pulled out the whiteboard. So tonight is my night, all right? Here we go, anybody excited? All right, um, so I'm gonna draw uh, a diagram that, I think it just helpfully captures this teaching for you tonight. It's a Venn diagram. Anyone excited for a Venn? I love a Venn. They're pretty good circles. Um, all right, our first purpose as the church of Jesus is to worship. Worship is our ministry to God. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. I just thought church was where God ministers to us. Well, I think the first purpose for us as a church is to minister to God, to love Him. By worship, I mean when all of us responds to all that God is. When our emotion, when our adoration, when our attention, when our affection, when all of us, our emotions, our thoughts, our souls, our being, is directed in the attention of God and responds to God. That is worship. So worship is not just limited to songs and singing on a Sunday, but worship means the reading of Scripture, it means prayer, it means the sacraments of our faith, things like communion that we do as a community. Whenever our attention and our adoration is turned towards God throughout our life, that is worship. So what that means is when we approach our gatherings together, um, worship, when we specifically sing, is not just an allocated portion of time on the run sheet to endure. <laughs> no, no, no. And worship equally is not something to make yourself feel good. It's not an emotional feel good thing. Worship is a core purpose in our primary existence before God. God made us so that we worship Him. God made us so that we sing like we sung earlier, worthy is the Lamb. Worship. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God dwelt with Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve with God. There was a glory that was given and it was perfect, but obviously humanity rebelled and God since that moment have been trying to get us back to the point of worshiping Him, of being in awe of who He is in every moment. Worship is our ministry to God. He loves it when we sing. He loves it when we cast our attention to Him. You know, in my 10 years of being a worship pastor, I've heard lots of funny comments and complaints from people in church. Can I share a few? So um, one of the ones I hear a lot is, I didn't get much out of worship today. It was a bit flat. The team were a bit flat. Ugh, sometimes. Or, I don't understand why we have to sing. I just come here for the word. I'm sorry. Da -na -na -na. Just borrowing that from David Stora. Important point. Here's the truth, we're not worshiping you. We're not here to worship you, to make you feel better. It's not about your preference, it's about giving God your preference. It's about worshiping Him, making Him known. Whenever the church gathers, it is to worship God. And no worship is ever a waste. There's no waste when it comes to worship. Think about the woman with the alabaster jar, right? She got a whole year of wages in a perfume and she broke it and put it on the feet of Jesus to anoint him. And what did the disciples say? What a waste. You could have got all that money and sold it and helped the poor. But Jesus responds pretty clearly in Matthew 26, verse 10. He says, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. See, Jesus loves it when we worship him, when we give him the glory that he is due as king and as Lord and as savior. And here's the point. Worship is not a means to an end. It is the end in itself. Worshiping God is our end and our purpose. We are worshipers. We are a worshiping church. Now, like I said, worship isn't just singing. It's also how we serve God and represent God in the world. Uh, Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, do it with your whole heart as if you're working for the Lord. 
That is how we give worship in our work. We do it as if it's for God because we love Him. Romans 12, take your every day, your ordinary. You're getting up, you're lying down, you're eating, you're sleeping. And what does it say? Take that and place it before God as an offering of worship. We worship Him. Worship is our purpose. Jesus even teaches us, before we ask for daily bread, give us today our daily bread. He teaches us, hallowed be thy name. Okay, worship is our purpose as the church. Okay, are you with me? Second purpose of the church is the Word of God. And this, specifically, is about maturing of believers. The Word of God is active and powerful, without a doubt, but it's only active and powerful in our lives if we open it, <laughs> if we study it, if we learn from it, if we grow in it, and ultimately, if we actually apply it to our lives. Paul says in Ephesians that his primary goal for growing people in the Word of God is to ensure, listen to it, that we're not immature like little children or that we aren't tossed around or influenced by every new teaching or culture. That's what he says in Ephesians. Newsflash, the church's goal is not to make you feel comfortable or not even just to comfort you in your time of need. The church's goal is to help you grow to full maturity in Christ Jesus through the Word of God. To grow to maturity. Paul says this is actually the reason for the Word of God to be teached and people to be matured is the reason he even became a minister. Listen to what he says in Colossians 1 verse 28. It says, we tell others about Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all of the wisdom that God has given us. We wanna present them to God, mature in their relationship to Christ. So maturity isn't optional when it comes to loving God. Maturity is a par for the course when it's the life of the believer. To Paul, clearly it's important that we present one another before God on the day that we stand before Him, not having known a lot, not having done a lot, but having been fully mature in Christ Jesus. Now, before you get your bee in a bonnet, the bee, bee in the bonnet, that's the one, um, by saying that our purpose is worship and word, I'm not implying that um, our only purpose as a church exists for Christians or believers. We've still got one circle to go, so just go with me, right? But what I am saying is that a, part, a core part of the church is discipleship. That's why we're here, to grow in God, to know God and make Him known in the world. And God, thank God, provides gifts to the church for this. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 that God gave us five gifts to the church. It's called the fivefold ministry. Anyone aware of this? Uh, give me a wave if you've heard of the fivefold ministry before. A few people. So, what Paul says is that God has given us five gifts uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And these five gifts are given to the church for what purpose? To bring us to full maturity in God. That is the reason why they're given. Now, these gifts are interesting. These gifts are at work in every church across the world. But often what we do is we assume or, or we um, conclude that all of these five gifts are present on the platform, right? But I wanna tell you tonight, these gifts aren't just present on the platform. They're also off the platform. Hey, I'm getting down amongst you because I'm trying to preach to you that the apostles are in this room. They aren't just standing on a stage. And I, wanna, I, I just wanna encourage you to wake up and be aware of what God is saying and how God is using us as a church to be His body. Listen, what's going on with Neil and Tanya, we have pastors in this room that need to rise up in Jesus' name to care for the community as they go through this difficult challenge. Oh, getting emotional. We have prophets and prayer people over here, I feel it. We have evangelists in this church that need to be out there more than they're in here, reaching people, lost people for the good news of Jesus. The fivefold ministry, the point is simply this. No five gifts are found in one person. It's not that five people lead a church. <laughs> it's that no five gifts are found in one person. In other words, it is only in unity that we can grow to fulfill our purpose. It is only in unity that we can reach full maturity before God. 
And it requires us to rock up. It requires us to encourage one another. It requires us to lean in to activate the gifts that God has given us. As the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 25, he says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another to pour courage in, to stand with, to edify, to lift up, to build up, especially now that the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. So whether we're in large groups, small groups, um, different kind of groups, it doesn't matter. It's not there. We're not meeting to open the Word of God to get you to serve more, to get you to give more. We're opening the Word of God to grow us to maturity in Christ Jesus. That is why we are here. All right, last purpose. Are you doing okay out there? Last purpose of the church is witness. By witness, I mean two things. Mercy and lastly, evangelism. It's been a while. Evangelism. Let me start with mercy. I think we all understand that as Christians, we're meant to extend mercy, kindness, Love, care to the poor, to the oppressed, to the downtrodden, to the impoverished, to the hurting, to the desperate people of the world. So much of Jesus' ministry focused on this, right? Uh, Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourself, to love people around us. And Jesus extended the bounds of what love and kindness looks like in a community when he went across the bridge, so to speak, to the Samaritan. The Samaritan represented the unlovable people. Think about that person in your mind right now that's popping up that you're like, they're really difficult to love. Well, Jesus encouraged us to love even the least of these. And Jesus so well articulated this call to love all people in summarizing it in Matthew 25, where he said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. So love for our neighbor it's close to the heart of God and is essential for every believer. Bob Goff, um, a great author and speaker, said the best way to show people that God is everything we say He is, is to be everything He says that we are. To be mercy with skin on, to love people as ourselves. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, right? Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Francis of Assisi, Saint Francis, said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I love that, right? We're called to be people of mercy, to love our neighbor. Let me tell you about Dwayne. I met Dwayne in our foyer a couple of weeks ago. Um, Dwayne would be in his mid-30s, and um, he said to me, Zach, I haven't been here much. Um, this is probably only my second time in this church. And I said, oh, when was your last time? And he said, oh, when I was eight years old, um, my family didn't have any food to eat. And so we came here and Riverview gave us food. And 20, what, 20 something years later, there he is standing in our foyer, now worshiping God, opening the word of God, all because someone, thank God for Riverview Church, someone showed mercy to his family. You never know how much an act of kindness changes someone's life, amen? How good's that? Obviously, that speaks to the last part of what I wanna talk about, which is evangelism. To do what Jesus asked of us, his final words in Matthew's gospel, to go into all the world, to make disciples, to baptize them and to teach them to follow and obey me, said Jesus. Jesus gives a similar command in Acts. He says, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and throughout the ends of the earth. There's this beautiful unfolding picture here of what Jesus means through evangelism. He says that we're called to our local, our Jerusalem, the place that we know, the people that we normally mix with, but maybe don't know that we follow Jesus. He calls us to that place. But Jesus also calls us to a place like our homeland, like our place, our Judea, maybe like for Perth, like Melbourne, you know, same kind of culture, but just better coffee, right? <laughs> so Jesus calls us to go with the good news to places like a Melbourne. But Jesus also says to go to Samaria, <laughs> to go to Samaria, the place that we would deem unlovable, the difficult places in the world, and preach the good news that people would know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is alive. And Jesus clearly had in mind that we wouldn't just do good deeds, but we would reveal the driver of our good deeds, a God who first loved us so we can love others. 
It's interesting, you know, across the world, in churches everywhere, it seems to me that we spend a lot of energy and resource in maintaining disciples rather than making them. I think the church needs to become alive again and awakened to the gospel and not being ashamed of the gospel in our nation, to see new disciples made, not just transferred growth, come on, new growth in Jesus' name. Millard J. Erickson said this, the early church gathered for worship and for instruction, and then they were sent out to evangelize. During the gathering, the focus was on fellow believers. But after the gathering, the focus shifted to non-believers. I wonder, when was the last time you brought someone to the Lord? Not to church, but to Christ. Challenging question, right? So a ministry to God, a maturing of believers, and a mission or a mandate to the world is our irreducible minimum from the basis of Scripture. So I wanna ask you tonight, where do you think Riverview is? Where are we strong? Where are we weak? Where would you place us if you were to place an X on that Venn diagram? You know, the danger for every church, not just Riverview Church, but every church throughout the world is an overemphasis on one area or a weakening of another. So let me explain. So if we were to focus on worship and word without witness, we would be seen and deemed by the world as hypocrisy, hypocritical. Uh, how do you spell that? So we, we love God and we declare how great He is and we, we love Him and we express our love for Him. We know the Word of God, but we're not active with anyone outside of the church. And what the church sees is what we believe is simply unbelievable. We're caught in a hypocrisy mindset. Now, if you were to have worship and witness, but without the Word of God, I think we are given as a church to fragility. Right? What happens is this is generally the emotional circle where we love God and we express how great He is and we love people, but none of it's founded on the Word of God. And so what happens when policies change and things shift in our cultural climate, we start to become super fragile as a church and we don't know what the Word of God actually says. So the danger as a church is if we don't emphasize the Word is we become fragile. Lastly, if we focus on Word and witness, we become, without worship, we become apathetic. Apa. I've done that every, every service today. We know a lot about God. We do a lot for God, but we don't love God. It's almost like we've got our priorities mixed up. We're called to love God first and serve Him second. Oswald Chambers once said that the greatest threat to devotion to Jesus is the things that we do for Jesus. In other words, love God with all of your heart, then love others. I hear you, where's community? Zach, you've missed the purpose of the church, community. But I think this is another overemphasis in our culture. We are craving community. And yes, community is a part of the church's mission. But I don't believe that it's necessarily the purpose of the church. Community is the context in which the church gathers, is the context in which the church fulfills its mission. But do not make community the centre of this circle. Community is not the goal. Community is the byproduct. Community is the environment in which we fulfill our purpose as a church. So where do we fit in? What's our role? You know what? Like, can I be honest with you? I find this pretty overwhelming. When I was thinking about this, I'm like, I'd love to say um, that I fit like right in the middle somewhere here and I purpose, like I perfectly get my worship, my sense of the Word of God, my maturity and my witness in the world like perfect, my ministry to God's great, but kind of just feels like a religious model, eh? And I feel like if I was to place myself and, and try and be in the middle, um, I would have to do some repenting before God to get right in a lot of areas. And here's the cool thing. While the temptation is to say that all of us need to reflect a perfect balance, all of us sit right in the middle, I think that robs the broader body of Christ of its power because there's only one person that can hold that middle. When we try and hold the middle, we try and take the place that only Jesus can occupy. So what if we, on this diagram, fit here, and here, and here, 
and here and here and here. You know, we have people in this room that are passionate worshippers. We have people in this room that when they sing, they encourage and inject adrenaline into our souls. We need them to be passionate about worship, right? They're the ones that are like, man, all we need is another encounter night. If all we did was encounter and pray, we are sweet as a church. (laughs) Some of us here love the Word of God. And they're like, man, that song they did was theologically incorrect. How dare they sing that song? And some of us are all about witness. They're just like, man, come on, everyone needs to be a chaplain. Come on, everyone's got to get out there. If only everyone was not just less lazy and got, you know. They want us to be more like them. And here's the crazy thing, is this is where we fit as the body of Christ. But each circle has its own egotistical gravitational pull. We want to make others look more like us. So all the worshippers are like, man, would you people just flip and sing and raise your hands for goodness sake? It's like Jesus is dead or something. We and people in the Word are like, man, we just need stronger teaching, deeper teaching. The teaching's too shallow. Come on. I hope this is deep enough. Um, and people who are in the witness circle, like I said, just are like, we're talking about reach. Why are we only talking about it once a month? Like once a year? Like, come on. Why do we not talk about it any other time? Fair point, but... Here's the cool thing. So each circle has its own ego pull, but there's one other pull happening in this circle. We are held together in Christ. Christ is the only one that can hold this center point. Christ is the cornerstone in which we're held on. And Christ is the one, says Colossians, that holds us all together. He's the gravitational pull that makes us more like Him. It's not us trying to make each other like each other, It's only when we look to Jesus and allow Him to play His role as the head of the body and not decapitate Him because we think we know better. We all play a part in the body. Listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12. The human body has many parts, but the parts make up one body. So it is with the body of Christ and God has put each part where He wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. That's a word for us. Don't force the body to look more like you. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. How cool is that? Jesus says that to us. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honoured, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. We are part of the body of Christ. I wanna encourage you just to play your role in the church. Play your part. Let the gifts of the church rise up and begin to serve Him so that His name is glorified. Now listen, when the body is unified, the head is glorified. And that is the principle here. When the body works in unity and we all play our part, the worshipers sing new songs, they pray and they lead us in prayer. When the people doing the Word preach and teach in our discipleship courses, in our connect groups, as they encourage us to go deeper with God, as the people draw us out of ourselves, out into the world. Only then when we work in unity is the head, Jesus, glorified. Can you say amen? John Wimber once said that for renewal in the church to come, each Christian needs three conversions, a conversion to Christ, a conversion to the church, and a conversion to His cause. Perhaps we don't necessarily need to come up with new things for the church to do, but we just need to renew the things that God has called us to do for millennia. A conversion to Christ, a conversion to the church, and conversion to His cause. Play your part in the body. And right now, as a body, we are unified around our witness. We're talking this month about raising money so that people come to know Jesus and people are helped in Jesus' name. I wanna encourage you to be committed to unity in that purpose. Look, we spend a lot of time worshiping and we spend a lot of time in the Word of God. And right now we're unifying around our witness. Remember, when the body is unified, Jesus, King Jesus is glorified. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? I wanna pray for you tonight before we leave.
Would you just close your eyes right now and maybe lift your hands or open your hands towards heaven? Whether you're here in the room or you're watching online on our live stream, this is for you. Lord Jesus, tonight we just acknowledge that You are the head of the body, that You are the one that holds us together, that without You, we fail and we fall apart. We acknowledge without You, Jesus, we can't accomplish anything of eternal significance without You and without the power of Your Spirit. And so right now, Lord, just across this room, we just repent within our heart. For those online, we just turn from our way and turn back to You, Jesus. We're sorry, Lord, for where we've had pride to put ourselves in the center of the body. We're sorry, Lord, for where we've taken Your place, Jesus, and allowed our ego to rule our thinking or our emotion. And tonight, we just give You all the glory. And we declare that You are Lord, that You are King, that You are Saviour, that You are the one that holds us together, that Your Name is highest, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We thank You, Lord, for how You hold us together. I pray, Lord, as we go from this place tonight, Lord, that You would hold us together as a body. Lord, we pray for gifts to rise up. We pray for those who are called to be worshippers, to rise up in the house. We pray for new songs to come up forth. Lord, we thank You for the worshippers amongst us, those who are called to help us fix our attention to You. We bless them tonight and ask that You continue to fan that flame within their heart. Father, we thank You for those that are called to mature us as believers. Lord, we pray just for an increase of Connect Group leaders, Lord. We pray for an increase of those that are willing to teach us in the Word of God, to bring us to full maturity. We pray for fathers and mothers of the house to rise up in Jesus' Name, to correct and to encourage the children amongst us so that we are fully mature in Jesus. And Father, we pray for our witness in the world. May it be fitting of who You are. May we be all that You say that we are so the world can see that what we believe is indeed real and is indeed true and is indeed worthwhile following. So help us, Lord, to extend mercy to those who don't know You. Help us to love those around us in our neighbourhoods, in our suburbs, like they are Your children, because they are. Help us to just break our heart, God, for what breaks Yours in the world. And help us to follow You, Jesus. Again, all for Your glory, Lord. We thank You, Jesus, that You hold us together. Would You continue to do so in the coming days and weeks ahead as we journey as a church towards a new season. Come and have Your way, Jesus, in our lives, we pray, to the honour and glory of Your Name. Everybody said, Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for Jesus?